All righty, people. You seem to be having a lovely time, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt it for 75 minutes, but um, it's what we have to do. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about random walks, just a little bit, just to finish off that piece. We're going to talk about variable transformation. This will come back a couple of times. Um, it seems a pretty benign thing, but we have one probability distribution, which has is of some variable. That variable is connected to another variable simply, right? Some functional relationship. And we can find the probability distribution for this other variable, right? So this is a standard thing in statistics, but we'll have some nice uh, opportunities to use it here, and it will pop up some interesting things, right? OK. So let's see. So I was going to start with, there's nothing on this one. Cryptic crosswords. So I just want to tell you that this is an important thing. Yes? So this is English, right? So the crossword was invented in the US, but then the English being English, well, they usually invent things and become terrible at them, like sports, right? So kudos, because they did, this is a pretty good job. I mean, you can see this. So this is from the uh, London Times. It's uh, reprinted. Did I ever talk about these in linear algebra? Maybe. I can't help myself. OK, so my uh, math teacher in year 11 used to photocopy it from the Australian, owned by Murdoch, um, which was just a reprint of the London Times. And I couldn't get any of them to start with. So now my sister-in-law um, takes photos and <laughs> sends them to me. Uh, so it's a little bit sad. The Guardian is free online, which is good. Yeah. So let's look at some madness here. Um, they're quite mathematical. So enfranchisement, right? This is a straight up kind. There are all sorts of different possibilities with these clues. So it's displaced ancient freshmen no longer being denied a vote. So that this turns out to be an anagram of ancient freshmen. And that's disenfranchisement, right? And eventually you see anagrams everywhere, which is problematic, right? So you see a mobile sign and you think limbo, which is just ridiculous. But your brain just does it for you. Um, very useless. No longer being denied a vote, right? So that's what it, uh, that's what it means. So it usually has a clue and then a, 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 um, a plain side to it, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's usually one which is like the first letter of uh, each word or something. There's one where the word is hidden in there. There, there are all these different things, so you can get stuck and go down different routes. So let's just talk about some more because it's great. Um, <laughs> This one here, magpie, right? So seven down. I've lost the thing, haven't I? So seven down. So it's silver. Silver grabbed by politician that is an obsessive collector. So eventually you never read, you never read this, right? So maybe later on you'll think, oh, that was an interesting sentence. But you never read the sentence. Eventually your brain is several layers in. So silver is AG, right? That's a symbol for silver. A politician is an MP. So you put AG in between MP. That is, where am I? That is, IE. It us. <laughs> See, it all makes sense. Um, uh, an obsessive collector is a magpie, right? They like to bring things back to their nest. Um, I'll stop in a second. Follow on to make certain when down on runs. So this sounds like a cricket thing. I know you're all thinking that's cricket, right? Because you follow on in cricket. I know, right, in test matches. I know that's where you're going with that, but it's wrong. So it's follow on. Uh, to make, so to make certain is in, so you can't figure this out, you know, you're not sure straight away, but it turns out to be follow on. That means ensue. Ensue means follow on. So that's the thing. To make certain is ensure, down on runs, the abbreviation for runs, just as in baseball is R, so you take out the R and you've got ensue. Uh, record, so this one's ridiculous. Record is an EP, so we're going back many generations of recording things now, right? Not even cassettes. This is EP or LP. Um, extended play, is that what it is? Yeah? Yeah? All right, we're making it up now. Um, record, that's EP, is, uh, is old, so that's ISO, uh, recording sons put out as not, pl um, as not playing continuously is episodic. So recording, so then we've got a, another recording which is a disc and a son is an S, right? S and D for daughter in genealogical trees. So you take the S out of disc and then you've got episodic. So. Very painful, um, and you get stuck on things because you think there's an anagram or it isn't. Uh, uh, so much joy. But it is weird. This is the weirdest thinking I think I do because you, you will just come to these and the answer will just come to your head often immediately, and then you figure out why. So it's a very strange, like, deep thing that's happening, which is useless. But you do all this computation in your head, and it pops it to the front, and then you might struggle with it for you know, a while, and then you go, oh, I thought of that straight away. 
We have no idea why. So it's a very spooky kind of thing. And um, imitation game, has anyone seen that? There's a nice highlight for the, for the cryptic crosswords, right? That's what they do in their leisure time while they're not um, solving uh, Nazi um, codes, right? So, not useless. It's good for you. Anyway, all right. Okay. Oh, and I always like these things, too. This is, uh, yeah, right. That's hideousness was the, yeah, okay. <coughs> Find as many words as you can. All right. Australians do like word games, actually. I think this is actually true, so... Um, I'm sorry. Pratchett, this is just a shout. I, I realize I haven't been showing enough Pratchett, but Pratchett's doing well, as you can tell. I, li I do like to snuggle him, and um, he just says okay. Anyway, all right. Um, ridiculous cat. Uh, this is a na map of Nantucket with catnip in it. Okay, so I appreciate the people who have followed, um, and I've followed back because it's, you know, it turns out a number of people have animals, and they put them on Instagram. <laughs> Because that's what the internet is for. All right. Okay. I, I wanted to say about this. I, this. I often do have things at the start, and I just wanted to give you a little more. So this is, I have a set of asides. Sometimes I show these. So this is a useful thing. Um, maybe you know this one. Some, maybe the math. So Conway is very famous, and, and actually in complex systems, there's this thing called Game of Life, which he invented. We might talk about that later on. But he's a very famous mathematician. And so he came up with this method for figuring out for some arbitrary date, what, you know, this is sort of this, you know, um, strange, spooky kind of thing that people could do. I said the word again, echoes. Um, uh, where you say, you know, what's, what was, uh, the, you know, the 5th of April in 1932? And you've got someone who, you know, collects stamps or whatever, and they, they can count how many matchsticks there are, and they just go, you know, it's a Monday. Okay, so, um, I can't do that, but this, this, this helps you set up a, a way for doing it, right? So let me just say, this year, the, I don't know why it's called Doomsday, it's a terrible thing, but the, anchor, the day for this year is Tuesday, right? So you just remember, for 2017, it's a Tuesday. There's a mechanism for figuring that out, I'll point to it. And, that, and then there's, there's this, these hooks that all of these dates will be that day, right? So the easy thing to remember is it's the 4th of the 4th, 6th of the 6th, 8th of the 8th, 10th of the 10th, and 12th of the 12th. They're all Tuesdays. It's very, it's quite useful. And then you have to remember a couple others. So you work uh, nine to five um, uh, on, uh, so there's five to nine and nine to five. So you can remember those as sort of a, uh, a pair. Um, and you, wait, one way to think about it is you work nine to five at the 7-Eleven, all right? And then, and they flip as well, right? So 11-7, 7-Eleven, seven, seven, nine, five, and five, nine. So if you have those pairs, you can create the other. So that's giving you four. And then you have to remember it's the last day of February or the zeroth day of March because computer science. For instance. Well, actually, not computer science. So the zeroth day of March, which is the last day of February, so that accounts for whether it's a leap year. And then you have to remember it's the third or the fourth of January. And it's the fourth if it's a, a leap year. So this is pretty useful. And then there are a couple of others that come out of that, like uh, Pi Day, which is the 14th of March, right? That's two weeks after the zeroth day of March. So that's also a Tuesday. July 4th is a Tuesday. Halloween will be a Tuesday, right? Because it's 10-10 uh, plus 21 days. Boxing Day, not so favored in the US, but Canada likes it. Uh, it's the day after Christmas. When apparently no one really knows what happens, but people, yeah, it's always, it's a bit odd, but that's uh, the 26th. Anyway, so this is useful. And then there's a whole, I, I mean, I use this all the time, actually. And then um, there's a way of figuring out which, you know, which day of the, which day of the week is the doomsday for this year. So it's a Tuesday, but there's a way of figuring it out, and I, I won't go into it. We're talking about too many things, but um, it's a little mod calculus thing here, right? So uh, if we wanted to do, say, 969, you'd have, you put 69 here, and then 69 divided by four, and you take the floor of it. So 69, to four, it's 17.25, 17 is a great number. Uh, so the floor of that is 17, Help me if I've got this wrong. So 69 plus 17. So now we're up to 86. Then you do mod 7. Did I get that right? Maybe I've got it wrong. That should be, did I get it right? So 69 plus, 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 plus 17 is 86. Yes? So it should be a 2, all right? So that should be. Ah, I feel like I've got that wrong. 
Okay. That doesn't feel right. It should be a Friday, I think. <sighs> okay. What's does it sound right? Uh, 69, 76, yes. Yes. Hmm. Um, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, and then okay. Sorry, this is the offset. That's what it is. So it's a two, and you have to add. So each century has its own offset, has its own anchor. So the anchor for 1900s is a Wednesday. So it's Wednesday plus two. So it's Friday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. I need. I need to. I was thinking about it before. So here are all the doomsdays for the calendar year. I mean, the calendar is an insane thing. And if you work with, you know, data science, you have to be a little careful with this, right? If you start playing around with history and things, you have to remember the, the strange or, I mean, it's often going to be done for you in a box, but you know, we had the Julian calendar. And then there's this point where we started to, and this is religious people talking to scientists and a sort of, a, you know, instead of trying to kill them, um, said, you know, Easter was moving. And it was, getting, it was clearly in the wrong spot. So, uh, you know, they said, okay, that bit about the going around thing, can you just like pretend that that's sort of true? So they did it and figured out that uh, they had to delete about hmm, 11, 15 days from the calendar, it just got wiped off. Just see it, no more, right? So one year was deleted, but not everyone did it at the same time. The English took about 150 years to get on board. So you have, um, or maybe even longer, you have you have weird things like George Washington's birthday is different depending on who recorded when. And it's strange. It's very strange. Uh, and I guess in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they never did. So, right, the calendar is just still moving away. Um, but it, this is where we get the exception, right? So we have the exception to the exception to the exception. So 2000 was very interesting. You're all alive then, right? Um, because it was a leap year, but it shouldn't have been a leap year because it was a multiple of 100, but it should, it should be because it was a multiple of 400. So it was... Very pleasing. Okay, all right. All right. Um, <coughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so there's a lot of other crazy things. But that's, a, that's a, actually a handy little thing to have in your head. All right, extra warm-ups. Okay, all right, let's go back to where we are. Um, you don't know me, I was going to show you. Rough things have happened recently. This is where we are now. Right, just to see, just to check. You know what's happened, but Charlottesville was here. Barcelona attack, hurricanes. And now it's sort of just puddling along, being um, normal again. Anyway, we check in on this thing. Uh, where we are now, I know I'm zipping through, right? We've got an assignment, Pyramid of Greatness. That's this Friday. Uh, office hours are different now. So there's office hours straight after this one and then straight after the lecture on Thursday. That will run for longer um, to 4.45. So a bigger session, so not on Wednesdays. This is a reshuffling of things. Uh, OK, yeah, good. And if you want to read more about that doomsday thing as a whole, see? People have fun. OK. OK, good. Let me get to this thing. So, we OK? All right, bonus. Uh, let me make sure this works. Good. All right, so we have this problem of first return, right? So we just have a simple random walk, wandering around. What's the probability that it returns after um, time t? Or we thought about two n time steps because it had to be even. And it has this power law decay. Um, with this exponent, uh, minus three halves, it's between one and two, or the three halves is between one and two, which means it's normalizable, but the mean, the variance in every higher order statistic is infinity for the pure problem, right? So the average time to return is infinity, uh, you know, all these, it, so it's a very strange business, but you know it will come back. So we went on from this in a little bit, and I just want to just anchor that again. Keep repeating words I've said. Um, Higher dimensions, poly are very interesting. Uh, finite spaces, you, if you have random walkers, they actually go uniformly everywhere. But if they are on networks, just to say again, they end up at nodes with um, probability proportional to the degree. And that's a very important thing, right? So it's sitting under Google, and also Google's changed a lot. But it's the essential thing there. OK. All right. OK, so I was just going to give you um, an example, and this is actually from River Networks, but I'll give you a little example, and it has uh, two pieces to add in it beyond the fact that it has this random walk in it. It has this variable transformation thing, which, again, as just said, is sort of a simple procedure from statistics, uh, but we'll have a nice piece 
there'll be, there'll be this bit here, the variable transformation, and then when we get to the hot model, the highly optimized tolerance and the robustness story, it'll matter again there. So there's that. Uh, and then uh, scaling relations. We have exponents that are connected to each other, right? Talked a lot about scaling, finding exponents, and you can have systems with multiple exponents and they, they'll have simple connections usually is the story. All right, so this is a bit different to our um, random walk uh, story because, well, let me just, let me go back to the picture, sorry. I wish this would work better. All right, so what you do is you set up a triangular lattice and then at each uh, point on the lattice, you flip a coin and then go make a little uh, channel that goes left or right. So you just do that everywhere and then a whole channel structure will appear. Right? And we'll think, if we think of things flowing down, this could be something more like a water pane or it could be on a, a very steep relief, um, on a pane of glass, I should say. Right? Here's a tiny little basin here, right? So everything that falls in this region would end up in this channel. There's a little one here, and this is a much bigger one, right? So this is a much bigger, a lot of stuff is collected here. And if we think about the boundaries here, they're actually random walks, right? So they're random walks. So the question is, you know, if we want to think about the structure of this, and this is an artificial thing, but it actually connects to real ones quite nicely um, with some modifications, which I'll show you. Uh, we want to think about two random walks starting off near each other, and then when do they hit each other? Right, so it's very similar to what we just did, which was a random walk wandering around, and we're wondering about when it will hit the origin again. This is now two random walks. When do they collide? OK. OK. Good. Hmm. So if you think about it a little bit, the walks can, uh, these, these uh, edges of, the, of these basins will actually either, um, so the, the, they, will, they will get wide, they can get wider if they walk apart, they can get closer to each other, or they can both go the same way. So half of the time they'll go the same way and the width stays the same. Uh, but they could get wider or they could get uh, more shallow. So we can kind of turn it into a, um, right, sub subtract one walk from the other and we get another problem that, like we had before. So basically it's a first return problem again, but it has some sort of extra piece in here where it doesn't move. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we know straight away that the basins uh, in this system, their lengths will, because of the previous work, their lengths, the, the, these, the lengths of them, the longitudinal lengths will uh, be distributed like this, right? So there'll be a power law um, size distribution. And in fact, that's exactly what you do see for random, for real networks, for real river networks, right? And so we have great data on this now. It's much better than when I was working on it 20 years ago. I had like mile resolution for continents. Now there's a lot of sort of 10 centimeter, 30 centimeter resolution stuff. Um, and yeah, so, but this is not three halves, right? So it's not the same exponent everywhere. But what's going to happen is the way everything connects together is the same as it is for random, these random networks, so these directed random networks, as it is for real ones. So that's useful. We kind of know where we've got the right game. This actually turns out to be still sort of an open problem. People can simulate landscapes fairly well. You can make something that looks pretty good artificially. But actually, there isn't a story about, well, they should all have this, you know, whatever the exponent is. There's something, there's, there isn't a magic story here. So that's kind of been sitting there for a long time. Um, so we know something about random walks. So that for a basin of length L, it's going to have a typical width of L to the half, right? So that comes back to, this is just a sort of a rough thing, right? So we knew if we have all our random walks, they start to form a Gaussian distribution. And the typical width after time t is scaling like t to the half, right? So this is uh, typical, it's, it's the width. It's the width of the Gaussian. Right, so if we have some random walks, they bounce around and they come back to the origin, we, we expect them to sort of have that kind of width on them. That was the first. Yeah, so there's a prefactor here, right? So um, for, the for the variance, it was exactly this. T it was t, and then the standard deviation was t to the half. And then so. You know, two t to the half and minus two t to the half would give us 95 percent, but the the scaling is t to the half. Like that's the that's the big piece, and and you have to worry about prefactors. The prefactor isn't you know a billion or something. It's small. So is that okay? Yeah. That's, 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 
Yeah, so the idea is you've, if you have a basin that's of length L, right? So one, one of these random walks, two random walks have come back and hit each other after length L. So we could have a whole, we have a whole batch of these, right? We make, we find all the ones that do this, or we make, we generate a whole bunch. Then we'd sort of, right? There might be some thin ones like this, yeah, and some weirder looking ones, right? But typically they'll have t to the half will be their width. That's the idea. Very rough. Because we know something about how these things grow. So we can start to do a few pieces like this. We can say, well, the area is going to be the length of the basin times L to the half proportional to it. So now we have an L to the three halves. And then this is just an important little piece here. This is the, the uh, variable transformation, right? We have a distribution for length. And we want to find the distribution for area. So uh, we'll connect them like this. First of all, we have this. We have a connection, right? We have areas length to three halves. The inversion of that is length is proportional to a to the two thirds. This is a bit odd, but this is actually how it's generally been done in geomorphology. This would be um, Hack's law from the 50s. Uh, anyway, this is an important procedure that's much more general than what, what we're talking about here. So we we need to connect these two distributions. You have to find the um, how the differentials relate to each other. So you simply take one expression, dl, right, just differentiate it, and that's going to be d of a two thirds. And if we do it exactly, right, just differentiating this thing, two thirds comes down, a to the minus two thirds dA. Right, if, you, if that seems weird to you, you can just do dl dA and, and we shift the dA over there, right? So this is how our, this is the Jacobian we're trying to get to here. So typical, Story, if we have two variables that are related to each other, you know, this could be y and x, right? This would be dy, this would probably of y, probably of x dx. They're connected. Now, you have to be careful, depending on what sort of relationship you have, but these things grow uh, monotonically together, so it's okay. So we, we have this already. We're trying to find this. We're trying to find the probability of area. So we know the probability of length is L to the minus 3 hours dl, and then we're going to replace these pieces. So we know this L is proportional to A to the 2 thirds. So we're going to stick that in here. That's L to here. Still got a minus 3 halves. So you can see this is going to be A to the minus 1. And this DL we just figured out from here is this blob. We're going to get rid of it. It's just proportional to. So there's A to the minus a third is the big piece. So these things cancel. We get A to the minus 1 minus a third. So that's A to the minus 4 thirds. Right? So probably... so. So these random walks, you know, we randomly sample from this uh, world and, uh, you know, go to a random point on the landscape and find the basin that, that is attached to that point and with probability uh, decaying like A to the minus four-thirds will have this area. So this is actually even closer to one, right? This is a minus four-thirds instead of minus three halves. So this is a, this is a very heavy-tailed distribution. You expect to find big things. And in general, the notation is tau. Uh, so, the, st the story is we can connect these things together, right? So that's the idea, and I'll just show you this quickly. Um, for real basins, you know, it's tough to measure these things, as I've sort of talked about. There are, vari there are these variations. Uh, for random networks, it was this three halves exactly. Four thirds was down the bottom here for tau. Uh, and then this, I'll, I'll quickly sort of just, because it reiterates what we just did. So, there are these laws for, for these structures. So. L is supposedly uh, scales as A to the H. It's a lot more here. For real ones, it's kind of like a half, which is dimensional analysis. Smaller basins, we get allometry. That's the claim, um, which actually means they kind of stretch as you gr go through size. Um, so we're going to just redo the calculation. We'll have these three exponents. Gamma, which is for length. Tau, which is for area. And H, which is for the, um, uh, this Hack's law thing, which is the relationship between length and area. All right, so we do exactly, if you go back, you can see this is exactly the same thing. Um, we, we have, we, we're going to say we know this one, we have this connection, we want to find this, uh, you know, in terms of them, right? So we, we know the probability of length, we know the connection between length and area, we want the probability of area. So we have to do this DLDA thing again. So instead of two thirds, we just put H, right? And we can differentiate that. So this, is lo this looks exactly like the previous slide. Uh, we've got L to the minus gamma instead of three halves now, and L is A to the H, so we're just sticking all these pieces in, and if you combine everything, you get this one plus H gamma minus one. So this is now A to the minus tau, 
And the sort of the big story is if you know one, two of these things, you know the third, right? So this is, a, this, this is not just, just about geomorphology, but many, many different kinds of systems. If you have scaling in them, this sort of thing is extremely common, right? So it's a very simple relationship. There's no exponentials or logs or you know, weird things here. It's just a simple multiplication. So if we put in 2 thirds and 3 halves, so 3 halves minus 1 is a half, 2 thirds uh, times a half is 1 third, 1 third plus 1 is 4 thirds, right? So we get the one that we had for these so-called Scheidegger networks. So these are called scaling relations. Uh, and these are um, <coughs> very common, as I said, and, and that you have all these power law relationships between variables, and the exponents involved will tend to have these simple connections between them. So when you want to talk about universality and so on, or, 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 or you know, there's these sort of big features of these systems, here we only need to know, say, you know, these two. And it turns out, this is too far away for this thing, it turns out that, uh, <coughs> in fact, you know, with more work, which we're not going to do here, I just want to sort of show you the story, that in fact this is true, that it's actually more, um, it collapses more. So this tau is 2 minus h, so this is the area exponent, the length exponent is just a flip. So again, for the Scheidegger one, this was 2 thirds. 2 thirds flipped over gives you 3 halves, 2 minus 2 thirds is 4 thirds. So this takes, you know, this takes decades basically for people to figure out. They start to kind of assemble laws about a system, and then you have to have some relationship, you know, start, maybe you have a big beautiful theory and everything works from that, but Ideally, you start to kind of unpack things and, and get this sort of story out. Okay, nice thing. So there's only one exponent, um, at least for this kind of description of these things. And um, <coughs> it means that, you know, you can just sort of, you know, this landscape over here in Canada, this landscape in, you know, the Congo or whatever, has some H parameter, um, H exponent, and the others are governed by it, or should be. So these are about universality classes. OK, we'll come back to that. Good. Just a couple of other examples before we finish this up. Uh, so this is uh, so random walks, right? So you could say this is sort of the vitality of something. It could be the money in your bank account, your gambling. right? We've talked about that. Um, but this is the health of some entity. And maybe it starts above, you know, it starts above 0. And then it fails when it hits 0. So that's, sort of a, that's what you would call actually a first passage time. It's a bit different to first return. Uh, but that has the same sort of scaling. Um, in fact, you start to see things like inverse Gaussians and so on. Uh, actually, in streams, this is a big deal for you know, ecological health. If you have a bad thing happen or something gets put into a, a big network and starts to distribute, you sort of imagine all these little particles, whatever they are, bouncing around, and some get stuck. right? So that's like a first return thing that bounces up and gets stuck. And some will just keep going. Uh, so this is a, not a bad model for how these things, because it's observed that this is true, right? So a bad thing happens, and, and the spreading time can take, it disperses, disperses, disperses. Not like you just get one big lump of badness come out through your river system. It takes a long, long time to clear. So that's one thing. Um, very, you know, this is, this, again, lots of random fractal structures in the, in the physical world, and in things like time series, like um, financial time series. Uh, so there's a, a generalization, and it's usually done in this way, that the standard deviation, right? So you've got this thing growing, you've got these little shapes growing, that this isn't a pure Gaussian anymore, that it's actually growing faster or slower. And the uh, standard deviation is now scaling like t to some exponent alpha. So if it's t to the half, we have the very simple story of Brownian motion, which is just random things being added together. This is more complicated, and, and we have words for it, right? So we'll say if uh, it's smaller than a half, that means it's not, these walks aren't getting as far away from the origin uh, as the Brownian motion one. We'll call it subdiffusive, um, and then super diffusive if it's greater than a half. So you'll see this, you know, systems being talked about. This is a super diffusive system, subdiffusive. Uh, as soon as you see, as soon as you're in these regimes, to produce those kinds of systems, it actually, you need uh, memory. Right, so here you only need to remember where you were and you just add a random increment. For these systems, you need to remember where you've been. You remember your path, right? So the next step depends on the path, generally speaking. Okay. All right, so that's just a few other pieces of random walks and that's a good place. So we're gonna visit uh, this business. So that was all about producing 
you know, Gaussians, which is this beautiful thing. These are universal. It's a universal shape. It's pretty weird, right? E to the minus x squared. That com comes out. You get to figure out how that works for random walks. Uh, but these are boring things in the sense that, you know, nothing very extreme ever happens. Yet we found all these, you know, beautiful scalings and so on. And the first return actually has um, this very unexpected kind of heavy tail distribution. So even within random walks, you get some w extremely weird behavior. But um, if we were just worried about how far away we are from the origin, then you know, nothing terrible would happen with time. But you know, we know in real systems, we get these parallel things for sizes and events. So that's what this is going to be about. That's unnecessary. So I've tried to um, make this maybe more useful. But the idea is you can sort of see this is the end here. Uh, as you go through these things, which card is being played? All right. Okay. <laughs> My God. Um, uh, okay. So variable transformation. Okay. So we've just seen an example of it, uh, and here's a more abstract thing. And we'll just go through. We'll get to an example. Uh, so we've got some random variable x. It's got some distribution, p of x. We've got some connection to y, right? So um, y is some function of x. And this is what we did with the, with the example of river networks, right? This is the general statement for it. We're going to say that the probability of y, dy, so um, uh, probably the, you know, where it, the y, um, y takes on the value y uh, and is, is such that x, um, x has to take on any of the variables, that, any of the values that would be mapped to y, right? So that's this kind of story. I'll try to put on this thing. Uh, do, 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 do. Yep. Right, so we have, uh, let me get rid of this. I'm going to make that bigger. Right, well, so we've got this relationship between them. Let's say it's like this. So, and this is x and x plus dx. This is kind of the idea. So, um, and y and y plus dy, right? So the probability that y is between is in between here and here. This is a continuous variable. Is equal to the probability that x is between x and x plus dx, right? So, the um, <coughs> The reason we take the derivative is it, give, it gives you the slope, that local slope there. And so there's a sort of a bigger range here right, for x to be in this little example. And it's possible, excuse me, it's possible you could have some function like this. And so for you know, y to take on a certain value or be between a range y and y plus dy, right, there are all these values of x that would work. So that's, the, that's why we end up with this. That's why we have to write down this piece here. It's the sum of all the x such that the function of x equals y. That's what this statement is. That's a such that. A pipe. It's a handy pipe. OK. How do we feel about that? All right, we're gonna do, we'll do some examples. But this is the basic idea. And then the horribleness is this is all fine here, but um, if we want to now put it into, you know, we want this to be a function of y, well, then we have to do the inverse function here for x, put it in terms of y, and then we have to replace dx by whatever dy is. So this is this horrible looking thing. This is really, you know, um, dy dx equals f prime of x, and then we've replaced x with the derivative of f. We've replaced x again with this um, inverse of y. Nasty looking thing. Okay. Uh, but we can do it by hand. So let's look at a, where, this, where this works. So we've got some relationship between x and y. We're not going to worry about this sort of the possibility that, it, that um, you know, it's a relation or whatever. Um, so it's going to be one to one. And then uh, let's imagine we just have some. Uh, this, so this is where the interesting thing can happen. We can have a nice distribution for x, you know, maybe an a exponential distribution. Or Gaussian, nothing bad. You know, it's not, it's not a surprising distribution, right? Uh, but we have some 
parallel relationship between two variables. So that, this is not uncommon, right? I mean, this is not a bad thing to have between two parameters of a system. And then let's look at what can happen here. So we're going to look at y large and x small. OK. So first of all, we have to do these pieces, right? So dy is d, and this is exactly the expression for y over here. So we just take this derivative. Uh, so minus alpha comes down, right? This is, you know, there's nothing crazy about these derivatives. There's x to minus alpha minus 1. Still add a constant out here and a dx. All right, so that's a start. And then we're going to invert this because we want to, we want to take the px dx. We want to replace the x's in that piece. And we have to replace dx. So let's turn this around. So dx is here. We've got a dy from this side. And then we're going to take this blob and put it underneath. So there's going to be a c, an alpha. That's this. The minus 1 is here. And now this x minus alpha minus 1 is x to the alpha plus 1. So what's happening is there's sort of a scaling being introduced here. And then, because we want dx in terms of y, we have to replace that x. So we have to undo this thing. So this is y over c, and then to the power of minus 1 over alpha. So y over c to the power of minus 1 over alpha. And then this was to the power of alpha plus 1. So that's that blob there. Maybe. Just some algebra. We're moving things around. So now we can take our dx and replace it with a whole blob of y. This is just a constant out here. This is a constant that's really y to this power here. dy is the big interesting piece. So the inverse power law is the big deal, really. OK. OK, so let's, let's put these things together. Uh, this is just cleaning things up a little bit. These are all the constants together, right? There's a C. We've combined the C's and the alphas and so on. Uh, the alpha by just left it down there by itself. This is y to, it's really alpha over alpha, so we're making minus 1, minus 1 over alpha. Cool. Right. So we're going to have another page of this, and then we'll do an example, and then we'll start on a new thing. So um, this is the big connection at the top, right? We know they're 1 to 1, so there's no sum or anything. So probably the y is between y and y plus dy is the same that as x between being between x and x plus dx, given this connection between y and x. So we just take p of x. We're going to replace x with its form. Right? This is the inversion of the relationship y equals cx to the minus alpha. And then this is the thing we just calculate on the previous page, dx, and th this is the interesting part, this whole big blob comes in. So a bunch of constants, here's our y here, and here's another y. Um, this is, you know, this is some function, right? There's some probably just, this could be an exponential distribution, or Gaussian, but this is just sitting out by itself, right? This is y to some negative power. So what can happen then if Right, so if for small x, for small x, if this becomes you know, uh, close to a constant, you know, maybe probably of x is a, is a uh, you know an exponential, like I suggested, then uh, this this approaches a constant, and you really just see this behavior for small x, which is equivalent to large y. So probably of y for large y actually has this power law decay, and it depends on the connection between y and x. Right, that alpha is the big connection between y and x. Um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, if, if we have a scaling, if it actually goes to, if probably if x goes to 0 as x to some beta, then you can just, right, that's, this is going to be this blob to the power of beta. You can put it all in, and you'll actually still get a power law like this. Corrections, yeah. Point is, we can, put a, we can put a benign distribution for x in, and if we have this inverse parallel relationship between two variables, y and x, then y will actually have one of these extreme distributions. So this can be a fairly easy way to understand why some things go boom, right? If we understand x very well, and we understand the connection between y and x very well, we can do this. All right. So just a simple example, <clears throat> if we did this with an exponential, as I said, right, so e to the minus x is a normalized distribution. We use the connection we just did. 
then you'd exactly get this. This would be the dominant term, right? This is for small x. This is turning towards. This is approaching uh, e to the zero, which is so it's just one over lambda. You get some other correction terms, but basically this is what's happening. The good, the good thing again about this is, you know, exponentials arise. You know, we have good reasons for them. We have a great reason for the Gaussian, um, and we'll get more to this. Uh, we'll get to this more with, with robustness later on. But that's so. This is a simple little story, just transformation of variables. Okay, so this is thing called Holtzmark's distribution, which is a bit strange, but it's from um, 1915 or something, and I guess people, well, people do this. They just think about crazy things. So, uh, random point in the universe. Measure the, I don't know, this was obviously not a very practical thing to worry about. Measure the, probability, the, the force of gravity. And then what's the probability, excuse me, what's the probability that, uh, <coughs> that you know, the force takes on some uh, value f? Well, so the observation was that it decays as f to the minus 5 halves. So this is minus 2.5, right? This is between the exponent 2 and 3. So a really big deal to understand is, this is the f to minus gamma, right? So if that gamma is between 1 and 2, then you have a normalizable distribution with infinite mean. If it's, and, and, and everything else is infinite, all the higher order statistics is, if it's between 2 and 3, you have a finite mean, but infinite variance, right? So small things, but now and then they can go boom. How would you select a random point in the universe? There's no, like, ether. There's no, like... <laughs> right, yeah. So this is, uh, you, this is just in someone's head, yeah. Or you have a machine that doesn't work very well. This is this Doctor Who thing, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, because you're right, and that's, what, that's the only thing I could think of, yeah. This is for narrative purposes, of course. But for some reason, kept selecting Earth, which is very strange, actually. Also, in the kind of the time that it was shown on TV, also strange. Um, Sorry, what was that? What's that? Oh, okay. Um, it was some madness about Doctor Who, basically, right? So that, that uh, just for whatever reason, it always seems to be in the time that you're, you know, watching the show. Yeah, you know, yeah. So uh, there are stories involved with this one, but it did have this property of uh, randomly relocating. Yeah. This is a bad thing, right? So most of the time, the force of gravity, if you randomly jump to points in the universe, nothing happens. We do have the whole warp speed thing, you know, and like from our stories. Apparently, you just pop out in a benign place. But this is something with, inf with an infinite variance. So now and then, you end up in a sun, basically. Not so good. OK. So, so there's, a, there's one of these little you know, ways of explaining this. And let's just work through it. Um, so if, you, if we think about just one star, and there's obviously a lot of these things, but if we think about one star, the probability that if you rent, if you um, randomly, if you're near that star, they put a sort of a big sphere around that star and just randomly choose a point in that star, the probability that you are a distance from the center of it will grow like r squared, right? So the surface area of uh, a sphere is 4 pi r squared, so yeah, there's a bigger and bigger chance that you'll be further away, right? Yep. So if it's growing like r squared dr, and so we're going to assume this randomness in space, obviously it's not true. Um, uh, so, so it's just a little bit of fun. But we know this, of course. This is Newton's story, right? Um, and as I mentioned, he wasn't, it wasn't obvious to him. Um, but it decays, uh, out of the force of gravity decays out of the minus 2 relative to the star. Uh, and so we're going to just do all these things, right? So we have a distribution, and we have a connection to another. But right? this is for r, and now we have a connection to um, another variable. So we invert those things. It's one of these inverse powers, right? So for small r, f is large. Uh, so it's going to do what we expected, I think. And we have r is proportional to f to the minus a half. So we're going to do all these pieces, right? Connect these differentials. OK, that's easy to do. So dr from here is df to the minus half. That should be this. So we'd get minus, it's going to be f to the minus 3 halves. Minus half comes down, df. Just basic derivatives. All right. So you put all those things together, you have the connection between them, you have the connection between the differentials, and we have this probability distribution looking like this. Obviously, it's only locally. Um, <coughs> it's a bit lumpy, space is a bit lumpy. Um, so we want to do this variable transformation thing, right? 
probably of FDF, probably of RDR, they have to be connected. So we're going to replace R with whatever it is. So R is F to the minus a half. And this is our DR is F to the minus 3 halves DF. Uh, we knew that this thing behaved like R squared. This probability distribution behaves like R squared. So it's this blob inside it to, to the square. Right, so this is F to the minus 1, F to the minus 3 halves. So those things add up and we get F to the minus half, 5 halves. So that's just a little fun excursion. But you, it's, it's uh, this sort of thing, and we'll see it for uh, forest fires and other kinds of um, real systems that we very much worry about how they might break, um, that this variable transformation does exactly the same thing over and over and over. OK. So as I said, mean is in, uh, finite variance is infinite. It's five halves between two and three. It's a wild distribution. Uh, yeah, randomly, yeah. So randomly sampling spaces, OK, but you could be really unlucky. Um, that's a video of a, these things aren't working anymore, but um, I, f I feel too silly to, to show you. But it's a great music video from the 80s, I think. OK, OK, that's a mistake. OK, so <coughs> I'll edit that out. Pleplo, OK. So I actually was terrified of Daleks when I was a kid, I have to say. I'm in the middle of the desert, and I would think, I would stare at the door thinking Daleks were going to come through it. How they would get up the steps, I, I have no idea. But um, really, really did worry me. Cause then, and then it took me a long time to realize it's a horror show, actually, right? Like, it really is, yeah. Man, cliffhangers, too. It was always four episodes, the music. OK, terrible. <clears throat> OK, there's that great BBC thing where you realize everything's made out of polystyrene, and they melt a city, and it's like this big. And, yeah. but when you're a kid, it's pretty real. OK, so. Um, OK, so pleplo, this is bad, right? Where you explain a power law from another power law, right? So that's, people will do this sort of thing. We want to get at it from first principles, um, pleplo. Uh, so, you know, brains are brains because there are people inside you, which is silly. So not allowed to do that. We want miwo is, is really nice. I'm just making these things up. Mild in, wild out. That's good, right? So if we have a nice little mechanism and we can see it, we can measure it, and we can explain it. And that's going to be the next section. We're going to, there's a big argument about this business. Um, that's been going on for about 70 years. Uh, and we, we want mechanisms, right? So we need mechanisms. So even the big black box users of today, right, with deep learning and the, you know, the, this, this renaissance of neural networks, many, many corporations and so on are using these things. And of course, we're doing it in science over and over. But um, people are making a lot of money out of it. But they're also starting to realize that, well, A, they can do bad things, right? So there's ethical issues. And B, not understanding what something is doing has problems for A, but also, you know, you can't, if you can't explain what's happening, uh, that's, that's bad. So, um, you know, there's sort of this initial stage with this kind of explosion of AI now where people are like, oh, we can do all these things, so let's do them. Now we're sort of, I think, people are sort of turning back and saying, why is this happening? You know, right? So there's some places like insurance where you can use all your machine learning you want, but you need to be able to tell people why it's, you know, you, this person's being offered this particular, um, you know, like why this thing for them would cost, you know, so much money and so on. Like why they're being required to pay more than someone else. So you have to have your machine pop out reasons. And that's hard, right? That's, that's, uh, that's, that's going to take a lot of work or maybe, I don't know, maybe it'll be done tomorrow. But uh, anyway, so mechanisms are a, still a big deal. Like why do things happen? Okay. Okay. That's unnecessary. All right. It's all unnecessary. OK. Good. Good. All right, but variable transformation. It's a simple statistical thing. If you haven't seen it, it's OK. Looks a little crazy, I guess. But there is just a, a little uh, algorithm to work through every time you come to one, right? So there's a, there's a formula, which is a bit ugly looking. But it's best to sort of work through a few examples. Um, and we'll do that later. OK, so, so we're getting power law size distributions out of randomness. And out, you know, these random walks, the first returns, it was sort of just one example. And uh, variable transformation, so it's a different kind of game there. But this is getting to this mechanism story. OK. All right, so here's the plan. We're going to talk about Herbert Simon's work first. So it's, I'll frame it in this way. Rich get 
the rich gets richer mechanism. There are many catchphrases for this. There's cumulative advantage, uh, preferential attachment, you'll see people talking about it. And it is an enormous story for networks, and we'll get to that later. Um, but Herbert Simon's model is sort of the, the big deal, the original one. So it's a 1955 paper. It's a terrible title. This guy was an absolute genius. And then we have Mandelbrot come along, uh, comes along and has a story which is quite different. So this is a, a random growth mechanism, and this is an optimization mechanism, right? So this is just like stuff is just kind of happening. There's, there's a replication and copying, but it's random. And this is something beautiful is being made by evolution and engineering, right? The best things are coming out, except platypus, right? Um, but that, so, th you know, these are two big pieces that are kind of always really at work, but uh, we can sort of fall to one side a little too much, like optimization is too much at work, or, or it's all random. You know, people get a little carried away with the, the extremes. But that's, that's been this, this long argument. Okay, so we'll do Simon's model first. So we're, we're trying to finish this first row here of cards. So random walks are additive ag aggregation, right? So we're building something up. We're just adding um, and subtracting. And we're getting, and we're, and we're making many of them, and then we compare them, right? There's no competition. We just sort of take a whole ensemble of them and think about the kinds of walks that have come out. So this is going to be a different thing. So we're going to have uh, an ad a system where there's adding, but uh, there's a copying piece inside of it as well. And there's going to be competition, right? So the copying is going to uh, create competition. So you actually create a world by itself, right? So we had to make all these random walks and then sort of compare them. You know, it's a very different game. Now we're going to make a, uh, an ecology, right? So you could think about animals or words or something, where, or cities, where there are a number of kind of competing entities that are of kind of like nature, uh, and they're somehow being replicated, right? So more squirrels. Squirrels doing well, they make more squirrels. Um, a city is doing well, more people move there. Uh, a word is popular, it gets used more and more. And, and you'll see this is a very abstract model, right? So it's not going to tell you how to write a book or build a population, but it's going to get at the, es it's, it's the essential model. And from there, you can do all sorts of complications. So as I said, words, cities, uh, the web. So in terms of um, uh, links between pages, right? So a, a page that's doing well, or a, not pages necessarily, but a site that's doing well tends to accrue more links, right? And again, this is, you know, Google's great insight was to say, well, what about the network structure, as we talked about, end of matrixology. Um, wealth, right? So there's an accruing of wealth. And that's that. This is this, is this notion, rich gets richer. Uh, productivity, this is actually, for, this is very, uh, this is 100 years ago. This is looking at um, scientists producing papers. Um, and popularity, of course, right? So you hear about something and someone wears these shoes or whatever it is. Um, reads a book, it gets mentioned, and it gets in front of something else. And that's going to be a big piece we'll come to later on. I still feel, I always feel like I need to apologize for Uggs. Yeah. Well, it's, so it's an Australian, right? It's strange, I mean, it's a strange thing. We had them forever, but you would never wear them outside. It's very important. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, blonde stones, that's, uh, that's good stuff. Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> Competing mechanism. So this is going to be the story where, you know, I have this beautiful story that gives these power law size distributions we see everywhere, and then someone else says the same thing, and then they argue humorously. Okay. Um, very common thing to do. Okay, so there's some history to this, which is pretty interesting, right? So, um, and there may be more before this, but this is the 1910s uh, when, um, <coughs> right? So looking at shorthand and trying to, you know, create ways to, to you know, record things very rapidly uh, a very simple thing to do was to say, well, all right, well, what's the frequency of words, right? So the most frequent words, we should make really easy ways to, to write them down, and maybe we shouldn't write the, we just leave it out, you know, and so on and so on. And people are um, smart about this. And of course, it sort of happens all the time anyway with language, right? We've, we had that, you know, the, the um, sort of cleaning up of the past tense, for example, for English. You know, it's a, a cleaning up of the code, so people have naturally kind of done this. That, that would be Mandelbrot's claim, actually. Um, so this is a, you know, these, these are the kinds of things that get found later on, you know, when something becomes quite famous, then everyone says, oh, you know, someone else did it before. So, um, so this is uh, population concentration, 
looking at city sizes. So they have a skewed distribution, right? So there's a few really big cities and there are many, many little ones. And there's this power law size distribution, roughly so for them. And it depends, you know, so say in, uh, it's not completely true. Like usually the biggest one can be anomalous in some way and, and not always the same way. But in Europe, for example, there are some cities that are just much bigger than, you know, the rest. They don't fit on the distribution, right? So if you rank them, this is a thing we'll do, um, as, as we've done before, we'll do this quite a bit, but the, we'll rank them, you know, one through n, and, the, and look at them on a, a log log plot, and you, if, you know, if it's a nice power law, then you'll have this um, linear thing, but the top one, the first one can, can stick off, it's just bigger. Um, not, always, not always true. So we actually have some work that came out of a couple of years ago in this course that actually, it turns out that Simon's analysis misses a thing, and there is a first mover advantage. The first mover in this model I'll show you actually becomes outsized, and, and this was, as far as we can tell, missed for 60 years. It's a, it's, it's, it's a significant thing, so if you're going to model things with it, it, it matters, so big deal. Um, so Yule is talked about quite a bit, and so this is sometimes called the Simon Yule zip distribution, where everyone tries to stick everyone's name in. Mandelbrot gets stuck on it, but Yule has this first work, um, and it's the number of species per genus. Now, of course, this is a, an odd thing in some ways because it's us, you know, um, categorizing the world, right? Going out and finding another squirrel and saying this is a squirrel, but it's a different one. Um, and, you know, things have changed a lot with um, uh, genetic work, but uh, yeah, we, we tended to produce, and so this is, I think still holds up though, that there are many, so there are a number, many of, many, uh, uh, you know, you'll find a, a genus with one species, and then you'll find, now, now and then you'll find one that has many, right? So you, again, this sort of very skewed distribution story. Um, you know, the analogy in words for a book, for example, is that half the, word, half the lexicon for a book, those words will appear once, right? So you'll have these gen very thin uh, genus story, and then you'll have words that appear you know, many, many times, lots of species. Um, so Locker, I mentioned before again, so this is a number of scientific papers per author. You know, many people have one, right? They have one publication. Uh, and if you look at citations, the mode number of citations for papers is, hmm, I think it's zero. It might be one. But I think it's not good, right? So it's a really skewed distribution. Most things never get anywhere, right? And, uh, and then you've got these you know, incredible outliers. And the outliers are all uh, uh, methods for doing science. That's true, which is interesting. It's not general relativity or DNA or any of these things. It's the how you do science. OK, um, so these are kind of precursors. Then there's this very famous work by Zip. We'll talk about Zip. Um, actually, I pointed you to some stuff where I talked about him, but we'll talk about Zip's effort again here. Uh, so this is, he died the year after, actually. He's only about 50, I think. He was a professor of um, linguistics at Harvard, actually, and just kind of got excited about everything and decided that, um, uh, you know, the social phenomena could be described like physical systems. And it's not true, but, you know, the right idea of just collecting data. He would have loved being around now, I'm sure. Um, okay, so, but this, this connected a bunch of things. So Zip has cities in there, he has language. Um, as you would have seen, has you know, marriage between people de depending on how far away they, they lived in Philadelphia, all sorts of crazy things. Um, and the gravity law, right? The gravity law, which is how much stuff moves around between cities, and it seems to be um, a product of the city populations divided by the distance between them because it's gravity in 2D. Okay, so it's 53, actually. Mandelbrot comes first. Mandelbrot, it's a chapter in a book, and he talks about language specifically, and we'll come to this in the second part of this. And he talks about optimization. So he wants the, um, the, you know, the most information for the least cost being transferred. Uh, it turns out, I think, for natural language, so some languages sound like they're being spoken faster than others. There are two things. One is that people who don't understand another language tend to think it's being spoken fast. And, but it's also apparently in terms of if you measure actual information content, per unit time, which is what it is, um, it's, it's pretty much invariant across languages. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. 
you can ignore that anyway. Um, so, just a side detail. So, uh, so I'm sorry for people in the back. Sorry. Um, uh, so Herbert Simon, and that's who we're going to talk about now. So um, uh, Zip's law for so he's, so Zip sort of inspires a lot of work here. Uh, so and, and he'll he'll point out word frequency, city size, income, somewhat disputed, but but income, publications, and species per genus. You know these five very different. Uh, examples, right, very different um, venues that have these skew distributions for sizes of this, if you look at the zip plot, they're ranked from 1 through n, they have these power wall size distributions, um, right, and, uh, and said, well, for this to make sense, I mean, they could be all, they could all have separate mechanisms, it could just be, that could be the way it is, but maybe there's a very simple mechanism that's behind all of these things that these kinds of they're all growing right language grows cities grow these pieces all grow makes sense evolution produces more things so far um, that there could be a a broad sort of mechanism that works for all of them okay so then we have work a little bit further on and this actually um, connects directly to Herbert Simon um, this is the solar price so he was a uh, <coughs> You know, so he studied um, science, so one of his great book is Big Science, Little Science. I think that's right, or Little Science, Big Science, I may have it wrong. But he, this, is, this is a while ago, so this is sort of him, I guess, and teams of graduate students going to shelves in libraries and counting the citations, right? So going to a paper and then going through them all and seeing which, so maybe it's in a particular journal, and then doing something reasonable, I suppose, at the time, which was a which papers in this journal are cited in this one? And then, you know, count, 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 count. Which, of course, uh, with the advent of the web and then with data being put on it, we eventually got to web of science. If you guys use that, Google Scholar has become what people, you know, it's open. Web of science is a closed thing. You could see uh, papers forward citations, which was amazing, right? That was an incredible thing. And, and, you know, now, of course, people do. Google Scholar shows you how many times you've been cited, and it's helpful. Doesn't mean that success is a weird thing, of course, but um, it's, it's useful to see where things are being talked about. Okay, so, so invoked a, a version of Simon's model to, uh, to get at scientific citations, which again, skewed distribution, um, and was able to show, you know, basically, a, a, you know, this, this story here holds up. Um, I'm not sure if he was aware at all of Mandelbrot's work, probably not. And then some time passes, but this was not unknown. I mean, this was published in Science, this paper. I mean, it's a big story. Uh, Barbazi and Albert. Barbazi is extremely famous, and I'm missing a few thingamajigs on his name. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so he uh, is one of the, the heads of the Network Science uh, Institute at Northeastern. And this paper is one we'll talk about in Complex Networks, along with the Small World one. Uh, which was published in 98, it's coming up to 20 years. These things have 30,000 citations now, right? So this is the start of a field, huge. Um, the two papers that really started a whole field, which we've come to call complex networks. Uh, and they looked at uh, the web, as it was then, for, just for the Notre Dame's website, actually. Uh, and uh, power grids, that was a little fishy. And uh, maybe they did the actograph, which is just simply if two people appeared in a film, they're connected. We'll look at it. Okay. They essentially reproduced a version of Simon, or created a version of Simon's model. They were unaware of it at the time, which is what happens. But it's, uh, it's not as sophisticated, actually. But it is, and to Solar Price had done it. In, see, this is a network story. This is about a growing network, right? You have a, a paper appears, and then another paper appears, and it cites it. And then another paper appears and cites it. And that keeps happening. So you have this. Uh, directed network, right, pointing back into the past. You can use this approach to look at uh, how legal systems grow, right? So this has been used for um, looking at uh, uh, Supreme Court decisions and all sorts of things. And page rank sort of basically works on this as well. Anyway, so this will connect back to here. We'll get to it later. Um, but again, a gr the, the big deal here is for, like, how do we understand these networks and structures we see? Well, What's being invoked here is, well, they have to grow, right? They just don't pop out of nowhere. Um, we'll talk about random networks, and random networks are very much in that category because they popped out of 
people's minds. The world does not actually make them, though, at all, not one. Okay, so Herbert Simon, I said he's, uh, he was uh, pretty spe spe spectacular. He was a political scientist that, um, uh, he was at CMU for most of his career, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, uh, but he, I mean, it's sort of funny to say he was a political scientist, but he, he published all sorts of things. Uh, he has a very famous uh, book on the architecture of complexity. You know, he really was thinking about these things back in the, back in the time. So he, back in the day, he, had, he went up against economists. He did get a Nobel Prize, actually, in economics, uh, but he sort of pushed against that, um, ba um, you yeah, know, the, the, the severe rational actor sort of model of economists and, and so he comes up with bounded rationality which is you can't know everything which is obviously true um, satisficing which is a terrible word but it's sort of in the vein of terrible economics terms which is uh, to be which is against optimizing right so the optimizers are the people they have to sample everything they have to go to every shop and then buy the best one and feel they bought the best one a satisficer is someone who's just has a bar that needs to be crossed in their head and they just go in and they say oh that you know this is good I will take those bananas. Okay, so <coughs> thousand thousand publications. Let's see, this should be fun. Um, he hasn't obviously been updating this, but someone's been doing a good job creating it. Uh, yeah, so pretty good. Um, <laughs> Three hundred thousand citations. Oh my god! Um, and then eighty-eight thousand in the last five years. Yeah, so it's solid. So H index. There's no about that. H index is the it's, it's, it's strong. So H index is uh, 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 so, so it's the number for which you have least, least that number of citations for all of those papers. So he has 170 papers that are all cited at least 170 times. This is a this is a very, this is a this is a, uh, uh, one, of one of these numbers used used to describe a whole how all There's a lot of a lot of these skewed distributions. Like you have a lot of a lot of papers that are cited. Some of some of successes. successes. It's a it's way, way to try and get that distribution. So someone could have a big one, big hit. Right, one hit, one hit, one hit. Just like music. And then nothing else takes it. Because they leave, whatever, whatever. Or you can have one of the little small burners that can easily take off, kind of like that, and have a big spike. So that's all. So, so if you have, you know, uh, 10,000 papers, uh, but they've all been cited 10 times at most, right? Then you won't have a very big H index. You'll have a, you'll be able to say I have 10,000 papers, which is what people used to do to make themselves look good. So it sort of uh, says, you know, you should make. It's a, it's a way of kind of getting at the important. So he's had a hundred. Wow, in the last five years. Oh my god. Um, and then the ten, that little uh, 10 thing is to show you that 590 papers were cited at least 10 times. So, you know, getting cited once is an achievement. Google says it gives you a little, a little star if you get 10 citations for a paper, right? That's winning. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard because it is, and, you know, it is this incredibly skewed distribution. A lot of things do not take off. Um, it's, a, it's a Ponzi scheme, basically. The Ponzi scheme of knowledge. So... Uh, so this is solid, yeah, and I think it's 20 per page, so, uh, I mean, I just don't even know what to say. All right, so, incredibly influential person. All right, so, lots of, you know, worked in all sorts of areas, you know, talked about this term complexity, really, yeah, Nobel laureate as well. Okay. So you should read about him. We'll come back, when, when he and Mandelbrot uh, kind of go head to head, we'll talk about some things as well there, which is fun. So, I'm just going to lay out the mechanism and on Thursday we'll work through it and then we'll get to this argument between him and Mandelbrot and we'll start up the Mandelbrot story. So, uh, it is elephant because I once got confused if I was saying elephants or not. So, it's, um, I think it's going to be elephants. All right, so imagine you've got, it could be an element, it could be anything you want, but there's an elephant that's colored and it's got some flavor, right? Green. And so, you just start with one of them at time t equals one. And what you're going to do is just add elements every time step, very simple mechanism. And this is what, you, this is what you're going to do. Uh, you're going to look at all of the elements that are already there. So it's just this big, long sequence. There's a, you know, the first one, second one. You're going to look at all of them. And with probability uh, rho, you will ignore them and make a new one. Right? You'll make a new elephant that has a new flavor. So if you think about words, You'll look at the book that's being written so far, and you'll, make, you'll add a new word that's not been seen before. You know, if it's just symbols, it's going to be a new symbol. It could be anything like this. 
If it's cities, you will say, I'm going to start a new city. Right? You look at oh, the list of people here, there'll be people, and it'll be which city they live in. Right? So it's going to be Boston, Boston, you know, something. Right? It's going to be this list of cities attached to people. And you'll say, with probably row, you'll say, I will live in a new city. I'll start one, and I'll put my label on. But with probably one minus row, you'll just randomly choose from what's there. You'll just randomly choose, and you'll copy them. So a very simple mechanism, right? So from the book point of view, you'll randomly copy one of these words and just put it in the next, time, in the next slot. You'll randomly copy one of these cities and just put it here, OK? If it was networks, you'd randomly um, choose from one of the nodes based on how, it's a bit more complicated, but basically how many friends it has. That's what you do there, right? So very simple. So you're going to add a new, so two ways, right? And I, I think I've said these things, right? So probably row, you create a new elephant. So that's the innovation rate, right? There's an innovation to this. Uh, there are uh, variations on this that try to look at creativity. Um, it's worked by Strogatz and some of his colleagues that try to do things where the modification is you create something new, and then you also add some other new possibilities in there as well. It's sort of an interesting thing. So the original version of this is from urns. It's this urn model idea. And you imagine there's a, you reach into this urn. It's got one ball in it. Um, and you look at its color, and you pick out another one, and you copy it and put it back in. Right? So it's sort of this, it's kind of a nice framing from a statistical point of view. So you're changing what's sampleable, but every time you sample from this thing, you end up adding a new thing to it, and that changes the probability distribution. OK, so there's these things. So then, right, so all the ones that have the same flavor, um, they form a group, right? So all the ones that have Boston written on them, they live in Boston. Uh, all the words, you know, the, that's a group. All the words hamster, there's a hamster here and hamster here. You say two, there are two hamsters, so it's a little group with hamster and hamster in it. So there's mutation and innovation, right? This is, right? And replication, imitation. So we've got these nice two very elemental things for systems going on. So this should be something we can analyze. And in fact, you can. Um, so I've talked about this. Could be words appearing in a language, right? Right? It's exactly this. Terrible way to write a novel. It's not how it works. It also means that you'll have a new word uh, with probably row. And that's not how, if you look through a, um, a book, or anything, actually you have a steady, you have a, a different kind of growth, in fact. It's not a linear growth. Um, it banks up at the start. It's called Heap's Law. Maybe I'll add a slide on that. Makes sense. OK, so here's an example. So there have been 21 words that have appeared. You can worry about their order, but in fact, for the statistical part, you don't need to. But here are these two things to just sort of look between, right? So. Um, you can think about the groups and you can think about the words. And the way this mechanism works is it doesn't actually worry about the groups, even though we're going to impose that later on. So with probably row, you would just make a new word and just blob it down here. It's going to be a new word, hasn't been seen. You draw a little circle around it, it's a new word. Um, and with probably one minus row, you choose from what's there already. So you randomly choose a word and then just copy it. So if we choose this ook, you just put another ook in here. So that actually gives you this group selection bias thing. So there are, there are 21 words. There are six ooks um, out of 21. So the probability that you get an ook is six 21s, right? I mean, fair enough. Even though the mechanism is very simple, the mechanism doesn't need to know about any of these groups. You've just got this list of things or a big box of them, and you randomly pick one out, and you say, OK, I'm going to copy that one and put another one in. Um, but this is effectively being created. So you get this kind of group selection thing, right? You get a, you get a, you get a, a size uh, bias coming in, right? So the biggest group, so it's, this is the rich gets richer thing. Fair enough? Yeah, so it gives you that elemental idea of rich gets richer. If you get in front at the start, things start to take off. We'll see that again with the fame and success stuff with this music lab experiment. But um, yeah, so a very elegant design. And what we'll do on Tuesday is set up, let me see, yeah. Uh, it's a rich gets richer story. Um, I'll come back to these words. I'll start with this on Thursday. And we'll set up the problem. You'll be able to solve it. You should solve it. It's a lovely problem. It's easy to simulate. It's 
It's very easy to simulate, but apparently no one did that for 70 years. Um, because if you do, you notice the first one, this first one grows, has, has, you know, gets, gets all this time to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a first, what's called a first mover advantage as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, office hours are now and then on Thursday. All right. Hmm.